I'm super glad to be here. Thanks to John. Thanks to the organizers for bringing me over. And you know, this is a conference I've always wanted to attend, and very glad to be here as a speaker. So the I'm here to talk about a little bit of the connections between the cybercrime underground and the Russian intelligence services. Something, a topic I'm sure everyone's kind of thought about, and I kind of took a bit of a deep dive and uh, shared my thoughts on it. So the title of the talk is uh, Sakheb Repper Probe of Spy, and breaking that down, it's to hacker reputation, lookup services. Lookup services <laughs> and spy services as well. So, you know, thinking of the GRU, FSB, and SVR, sort of traditional ones there. So, the aim of my talk is to basically help you think more deeply about the intrusions that you analyze and basically help you make connections between the, uh, you know, the types of things when you're looking at, uh, basically makes you <laughs> want to think more deeply about the types of things um, you're investigating and try and mitigate some of your biases and try and uh, re basically rethink re the ways that you've been doing things as well. Um, so why does most cybercrime come from Russia, you may ask? <laughs> so Russia actually has one of the uh, largest and oldest cybercrime undergrounds if you compare it to any other country. And the interesting thing is uh, they actually have a you know, community of very technical people and with a brutally low salary and a sort of a slowing and aging economy with no, which is becoming ever increasingly isolationist, um, you know, people tend to turn to making money in different ways, making money in different ways. Uh, so that's definitely one of the main reasons, but we're going to dive into some more as well. Um, the other interesting thing is the fact of this old unwritten rule of cybercrime. Uh, the fact that you can analyze pieces of malware and you can see them performing system language checks uh, you know, for, for example, the R Evil ransomware group, um, you can actually see which countries the malware doesn't execute in. And it's a pretty telltale sign of the fact they have these kind of tacit agreements and, uh, between them and, and their, you know, the country, the law enforcement and officials of the country they reside in. Um, yeah, next slide. So the other interesting thing is the fact that Russia essentially permits cybercrime. They, any time there's any opportunity for countries to come together and collaborate on tackling these issues, uh, which do actually impact Russia themselves, they basically, you know, can't always turn their back on the rest of the world. You know, they, they had a, uh, the Budapest Convention uh, many years ago, and they basically decided to not take part in that because it violates their national sovereignty, uh, which is kind of, you know, uh, it's kind of depressing if you can imagine, you know, you have all the, uh, international law enforcement agencies contacting Russian law enforcement, asking for details and information, and you know they're never allowed to really provide anything. And if you actually think of some examples of if people actually go out of their way and risk their necks to share information, such as you know CEOs of some cybersecurity companies, uh, they do actually get arrested and thrown in jail for even trying. Um, so definitely uh, shutting that down. Um, another example of how Russia commits uh, permits cybercrime, uh, and, and uh, an interesting study that the University of Oxford did in, in the UK, they actually took, they actually analyzed five different types of cybercrime and they put it into uh, categories of which is the most common and which is the most, uh, you know, most prevalent from each country. And is to nobody's surprise, Russia is number one, <laughs> as they are in many of these types of research studies and things, but this is a, a first time, a world first cybercrime index that, that, that Oxford put together. Um, I mean, interestingly, Ukraine's second as well, <laughs> probably because of they're so close to Russia. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sure the Ukrainian cyber police starting to chip away at that statistic as well. Um, you can also see by the fact there's so many Russians on the FBI cyber most wanted list that they, you know, they, there is kind of a habit of the fact that uh, there's no there's no denying that Russia is the global hub of all sort of epicenter of cybercrime, and I'm sure there's many cybercrime groups there that you recognize and have investigated yourselves. Um, one group that I, I was pretty intimate with, uh, you know, several years ago was Our Evil. Um, I did, a, did an episode of a little podcast known as uh, Darknet Diaries on that one. Um, but they, it's definitely fascinating to then examine these, the links between these organized cybercrime groups making millions of dollars and the Russian intelligence services themselves. So, you know, as we actually explore how deep cybercrime runs in Russia, you can even see uh, the fact that you have darknet market 
uh, darknet drug markets and, and credential markets and things running advertising billboards in the streets of Moscow. <laughs> so it's pretty, it's pretty uh, you know, a cyberpunk type of dystopian reality when you see cyber criminals basically running your, your city advertising <laughs> spaces. Um, and then there's also the famous, you know, evil corp, camp uh, evil corp videos that the NCA shared before of uh, Lamborghinis and things drifting around Moscow. You know, it just, just goes to show they're laughing in everyone's faces about how powerful and how untouchable they are, unfortunately. Uh, and then, of course, you have our evil, which was, you know, sharing, in sharing pics on Instagram of them staying on in luxury hotels and things, living it up in a very extravagant lifestyle. Um, but the other thing I really wanted to touch on today, which I think... I've not really seen much research else onto it, is the fact that each Russian intelligence service interacts with the cybercrime underground differently from each other. So the GRU, the main, the sort of military intelligence, uh, interacts uh, differently from, from the other two by a lot of the time they like to use crimeware uh, for their own operations. They, they're not so much recruiting cybercriminals as much as they are taking and buying malware and buying uh, other types of uh, services and things from the cybercrime underground, and leveraging it for their own campaigns. And the other interesting thing is because of, you know, obviously you have plausible deniability. If you're an intrusion analyst and you detect some sort of run-of-the-mill cybercrime uh, piece of malware on, a, on an endpoint, you may dismiss it as a, you know, a nation-state targeted attack. So obviously it makes sense for them to try and muddy the waters and, and, and make attribution harder. But I mean, as a community, as everyone in this room, I'm sure we can see through some of that ourselves as well. Um, the FSB is an interesting one as well because they uh, interact with the cybercrime underground differently from the GRU. They tend to kind of recruit cybercriminals and, and work with them on joint operations in, in, to some regard. Um, they basically are fully aware of which cybercriminals are active and, and figure out how they can leverage their you know, capabilities and infrastructure for their own goals. Um, if you if you analyze and, and think about some of the past campaigns of the Yahoo hack several years ago, you know, there was a case where, you know, access and things were gained potentially by cyber criminals and, and support and then offered to the intelligence services and then basically in return for, you know, they can continue their campaigns. Basically, you know, the old tap on the shoulder. And the other interesting thing is the fact that the FSB is the agency that is responsible for sort of internal affairs and state security. So they are the ones who are most likely to be aware of which cyber criminals are active and who's, who, which are the ones they should take down. If you think, cast your minds back to the R evil arrest in uh, January 2022. And the other the last agency that I wanted to bring up was the Foreign Intelligence Agency, the SVR. They are probably largely considered one of the most you know, advanced, sophisticated groups that uh, you know, breach all sorts of important technology companies. Um, but they actually not so much interact with cyber criminals directly, but they kind of are uh, uh, more patient and they observe what's going on in the cyber underground and figure out how they can leverage those things to their own advantage without directly interacting with it themselves. So a case study is uh, back in, I believe it was uh, September 2022, the Herr Turler, one of the infamous uh, FSB Center 16 groups, who've been active for you know, several decades at this point, uh, they were very interesting research produced by Mandiant was the fact that they were able to detect USB infection, like USB malware infections inside certain organizations and basically register the domains, the expired C2 domains and regain access that way uh, by tracking these, you know, cyber criminal malware botnets, which is pretty concerning if you consider how prolific and how widespread these malware botnets are. Uh, this could basically happen at any time. Uh, you may consider you know, generic 10-year-old USB malware, not really much of a threat. But if you're a high-priority, high-value tar high target, um, you know, basically you can't discount anything as being a threat. Another interesting thing is, this is sort of where the probiv side of it comes into, is the fact that Russia is a pretty corrupt society. And the fact that if you have the money, you can pay someone who knows someone who knows someone to get you access to some sort of information. Uh, that can be, you know, mobile mobile carrier information. That can be, uh, you know, telegram account ownership. That can be, or you know, it could be depending on, you know, the state, the status of their citizenship or passport, or what countries they're allowed to go to and from. Um, I basically came across this uh, by reading some of the Cert Ukraine advisories that they produce on their website, and they actually specifically called out the name of a company um, called the Da Vinci Group. Because uh, they normally use, you know, their, their naming generation. It's like UAC 000 whatever. Um, but they, this time they decided to call out a company by name. 
And they just listed some of the IOCs and things. And I was like, OK, this is a little bit more interesting, a little bit unusual for what they normally do. Um, and I decided to basically look up, to go to their website and, uh, and go onto the forums and things. And I could see all sorts of services that they offered. They even had uh, an Instagram account and a Facebook account. And they had, you know, like models where you're holding up a computer with their logo on it and stuff. It's kind of ridiculous. I did do a, a blog on it as well, if you want to read that on, on my website, um, Um But yeah, it was, it was very interesting. Um, and they also, on their website, they also list, you know, pricing ranges of uh, how much something can cost to gain access to some, you know, a target of yours information. So uh, with basically based on the types of access that they had, uh, types of services and access and data they could provide, you pretty much can't do that unless you are some sort of law enforcement or have connections to the deep, you know, deep uh, you know, agencies of the state. Um, so that's pretty much, you know, I believe and agree with Ukraine's assessment that they are connected to the FSB. The, another interesting case study uh, that, I, you know, when I came up, when I was researching this talk came up was the fact that the SVR, uh, again, I believe this was based on Mandiant intrusion analysis, was the fact that they had used a basically info stealer uh, cookie, uh, that, a cookie that had been stolen for a session replay attack to gain access to a Microsoft 365 environment. Um, and they found out that it was stolen by an info stealer on the endpoint. Uh, and the fact that that info stealer had arrived by a sort of cracked software. Um, <laughs> you know, there's all sorts of organizations that try hard to ban software, but there is, uh, you know, one country in particular that is a pretty bad wares problem, which I can pretty much guess who was the victim in here. <laughs> but they, um, you know, the fact that this is very interesting because the fact that this means that the SVR very is likely monitoring the credential marketplaces that sell, buy and sell info stealer stolen data. Um, they're kind of slowly, silently sitting there waiting for uh, you know, a high value target to appear and then buy the access and gain access that way. Um, definitely something, some sort of notable TTP to, to realize. And uh, again, you can't discount these generic threats because if you're a high value target, someone's going to be looking for you. Um, the other side of it is the fact that the SVR likes to use all sorts of commercial offensive security tools, uh, namely cracked ones that have been spread and shared around on forums and telegram channels, things like you know, breach forums and raid forums and all sorts of cracked key gen Russian speaking telegram channels, which if you know you try hard enough you can find and get into. Um, but again, it's it's an interesting strategy of theirs to leverage some of the stolen tools and tactics and things that they see cyber criminals doing without directly engaging them and working with them uh, themselves. Uh, another interesting thing, this was kind of a, a thing that stuck out, stuck out to me from reading some of the research that CISA and FBI put out, uh, basically saying that you know, a few years ago they said the interesting thing about the SVR was they were using false identities and cryptocurrency accounts to uh, basically register uh, VPSs, and they used a network of VPS resellers to buy some of this stuff. So it's kind of like you know decent opsec level stuff to to register infrastructure. But the thing that stuck that was really you know striking to me was the fact that this is exactly what cyber criminals do. <laughs> you know you may think of, if you you may have seen some sort of recent research about Chinese APT groups comp compromising IoT IoT uh, devices and things and, and building botnets on those. Um, you know we we have seen groups like APT28 doing that. Um, but the interesting thing here was the fact that they basically copied the cyber criminal infrastructure setup service step by step. And that kind of, to me, made me think that they were potentially someone on that team has very well, you know, very well uh, strong experience of how cyber criminals do things and potentially was a cyber criminal in a past life. Um, coming back to the GRU, uh, they basically had a, a lot of interactions with uh, cyber criminals as we can tell, as we know, uh, over the years. And the other interesting thing was they basically co-opted a cyber criminal botnet into, to repurpose it for their own campaign. So they, again, had been monitoring how cyber criminals were setting up infrastructure, compromising devices, and allowing that crime to go on, and then eventually realized that, OK, we could use this for our own campaigns ourselves. So uh, again, it's another reason, another another reason for them to allow cyber criminals to do their thing and permit it uh, from taking place from their country is because it just comes in handy for, for whenever, whenever they want to run the campaign themselves. 
Um, and how could I talk about you know Russian intel and cybercrime and things without bringing up Sandworm uh, with uh, you know the man himself in the room? <laughs> um, using uh, you know they use all sorts of crimeware and things, Black Energy, Petra ransomware, which they turned into a, a wiper. Dark Crystal Rat is something they've more recently done in the last couple of years. Uh, again, it's just one of these commodity crimeware tools uh, that, you know, if, if you're a, a, a telecom company in Eastern Europe, if you see these kinds of things hitting your inbox, you may not realize the sort of real danger and threat that you're actually facing and could have lulled into like a, maybe a false sense of security because you think uh, it's pretty much, you know, commodity spam. We'll just dismiss that uh, without realizing that, no, it's the GRU, they want to get in and blow up your whole network. <laughs> Um, and then there's also uh, recently Google Tag put out a report of uh, the Radamanthus dealer malware. So again, you know, another uh, crimeware to monitor for potential GRU activity, potentially. Um, another interesting fact is the fact that at the start of the Ukraine war, uh, probably well, even a couple of weeks before the Ukraine war kicked off uh, in January 2022, the you know a, new, a number of Ukrainian government entities were hit by sort of defacement attacks and a couple of wipers, I believe. Uh, and then some of the data that was stolen, you know, previously ended up on raid forums, which is a sort of Western speaking cybercrime forum, which I'm sorry most people in the room are aware of, but they uh, decided to create this persona called Free Civilian and start leaking that stuff on, on these uh, Western speaking cybercrime forums, probably with the aim of, you know, us researchers in the room picketing it, picking it up and, you know, uh, you know, writing about it and publishing it and things. And, you know, it's kind of like a, a interesting information operation in, in that regard of, of uh, actually trying to, you know, scare and scare population into thinking government data has been stolen and leaked. And then the other interesting thing was uh, an investigation by Brian Krebs, which was on uh, a core member of the Mazafaka forum, which was a top tier cybercrime forum with all sorts of threat actors that you're probably aware of and cybercrime groups that you're probably tracking on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, things like, um, you know, sort of ransomware gangs and, and banking Trojan turned loaders uh, campaigns as well. Uh, he was actually a core member of that forum, uh, but a bit of a, you know, bit of sleuthing by Krebs found that he, on his Facebook, on his uh, V contact page, there's a picture of him, you know, as in some sort of GRU uh, Spetsnaz uniform himself. So again, it goes to show uh, you know, operators have, you know, potentially other lives or past lives as well. Um, the other interesting thing is the fact that cyber criminals from Ukraine, uh, cyber criminals can target Ukraine on basically on behalf of Russia. Uh, but some interesting research was found that mail spam campaign, campaigns traditionally used for ransomware precursor uh, operations, uh, they found that they had been basically stopped all the external targeting of, of global uh, attacks uh, and sort of European and, and Western and, and US, USA based companies uh, to actually focus everything on Ukraine. And this kind of goes to show that cyber criminals are pretty much on call in some regards to, to supporting their government. And again, sort of the old tap on the shoulder. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the current ransom war, uh, I thought I'd just chuck in a slide of, you know, we, everyone, we've had quite a few talks and things, the great uh, information things shared by people today about ransomware. Uh, but the fact that, the fact is, you know, there's a currently an ongoing ransom war and we are the targets of it. Uh, and event, basically this stuff is going on and, and being permitted with only, you know, a handful of disruptions, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute as well. So when Russia actually does make arrests and does stop some of these ransomware gangs, it's kind of an interesting way that they do it. It's never, it's never straightforward, it's never straightforward with them. There's always some sort of signaling going on uh, by the fact that uh, at the same time, at the very same day that the FSB arrested our evil, uh, they also, that's when they performed the sort of wiper defacement attack against Ukraine. <laughs> so it's kind of a, you know, why would they, why did they decide to do it that day? Um, at, at the same time as they launched some sort of oper operational attack as well. Again, it's you know plausible deniability. It's uh, you know distracting and and only targeting certain audiences and things. It's all it's all an it's all an image thing with them really at the end of the day, and a perspective thing. Again, you know other sorts of arrests they make. Um, you know, not long ago, earlier this year, there was a a, a, a malware developer on Telegram uh, who was selling you know binaries and loaders and whatever. Uh, steal, a, steal a source code or something on Telegram, and he was randomly arrested by the FSB. Like, why would they decide to focus on this one one person 
and publicize the fact that they arrested this one guy. Um, it's kind of uh, interesting to think about. I mean, we could all theorize it, but at the end of the day, sometimes it's a bit of a mystery. <laughs> um, so a couple of the other uh, types of arrests and things that actually uh, seems to be they were potentially trying to crack, trying to make it appear that they were cracking down on corruption by arresting some sort of senior officer. Um, again, at the end of the day, it's a bit of a power struggle going on in Russia all the time, and any time one politician gets a bit too powerful, a bit uh, doesn't seem as closely aligned to the, you know the main regime, they can always you know create some sort of charge to you know to take take that remove that opposition out. So, several conclusions at the end of the day. I at the end of the day, it comes down to the fact that cybercrime is very intertwined with Russia, Russian intelligence services, and you should. Always keep that in the back of your mind, I think, when you're investigating some of this stuff, especially if you work for a high-value target. Um, you know, if you happen to know that your organization is potentially within the targeting scope of a, you know, intelligence service, uh, you also still need to be acutely aware of the fact that cybercrime uh, campaigns can be turned into some sort of espionage ca campaign at any moment in, in, in some regards. So this is, you know, it harks back to uh, the first talk of the day when, um, Selena said that we should be all thinking of APT as, you know, cybercrime and, and, you know, state at the same time, really. Um, yeah, again, you know, cybercriminals are on call and, um, you know, there's, a, there's always a huge financial incentive for cybercriminals uh, to run these campaigns. They're never going to be, basic, they're basically never going to be arrested from it um, and it causes damages, damage to the West as well. So it's going to continue, and until we see some sort of major change and major disruption, uh, the cycle is always going to continue, and it's the you know it's the infinite game at the end of the day. Uh, some further reading. So we've got some reported futures dark covenant paper and things by the Atlantic Council. Highly recommend everyone uh, having a look flick through these. I definitely enjoyed them myself uh, when I was researching this talk, and yeah, some great considerations to make that when you're whenever you're making an assessment, you, you should be including some of this stuff as well. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> <It's fair. laughs>